you're about to enter into a new world of knowledge, curiosities, and high strangeness. This is a podcast of Straight Up Strange Productions. You're listening to Mysteries and Monsters. I'm your host, Paul Bestel. This week, we return to the world of the paranormal in the company of Canadian paranormal researcher and investigator Morgan Knudsen. Morgan is a regular contributor to Haunted Hospitals and Paranormal 911, both on the Discovery Channel, as well as being the author of Teaching the Living, as well as being a spiritual and paranormal lecturer. Morgan has brought a more science-led approach to hauntings and helping those that claim to be haunted. Can a family dynamic increase paranormal activity? Does how we feel about ourselves cause us to deal with things in the wrong way? Can the atmosphere in a home create fuel for a paranormal occurrence? Morgan and I dive into the psychological responses based on our environment, our upbringing and our cultural exposure. Are ghosts simply part of quantum physics? Is this simply our brains trying to deal with some sort of energy release around us? Or... Are ghosts and hauntings all part of what John Keel proposed as part of his overriding interdimensional hypotheses for all Fortean experiences? Or are they simply ghosts? We also dive into some of the academic studies into parapsychology currently going on around the world, as well as discussing poltergeists and touching on the Wendigo phenomena. It's always great to spend some time in Morgan's company, and I hope you find the conversation as thought-provoking and as challenging as I certainly did. As always, you can support the show for $4 a month by clicking on the Patreon link in this week's show notes. You can also find Mysteries and Monsters across all social media platforms. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. You can subscribe to the Mysteries and Monsters channel on YouTube, and you can find our website at mysteriesandmonsters.com. Artwork, as always is down to Dean Bestall. The show is produced by Brennan Storr of the Ghost Story Guys and Mysteries and Monsters is delighted to be a part of the Straight Up Strange Network. Now, let's join Morgan Knudsen as we grapple with the possibilities of what exactly a paranormal occurrence could be. On today's episode, it's a warm welcome back to Canadian paranormal researcher and friend of the show, Morgan Knudsen, with a continuingly expanding TV resume and a reputation for challenging the preconceived ideas of what the paranormal is, it's always a pleasure to speak with Morgan. Morgan, welcome back to Mysteries and Monsters. Oh, thank you so much, Paul. I love, like, like I was saying to you earlier, you know, I love doing this show and it's, it's just so great and your guests are always so great and I'm glad to be a part of it. No, thank you. And thank you for your, uh, constant support and sharing of, of my interviews. It's always, <laughs> it's, it's always nice when, oh, when people are very kind. So I'm very humble and, uh, delighted to have a chance to have a proper conversation because obviously the last time we spoke was, um, your, very kind contribution to my 100th episode which was awesome by the way <laughs> it was a great <laughs> series of episodes yeah well i thought i'd mix it up a bit it was we had some good stuff and uh, and you gave us a fabulous contribution which i'm sure we'll dive into in a bit um and obviously since the the last time we spoke which i can't believe is nearly 60 episodes ago when you first appeared back in uh the summer beginning of the summer last year when the world seemed to be a very different place <laughs> <It was. laughs> so since that point obviously things i would imagine as for most people in in any field morgan have been quite difficult in regards to trying to do some any kind of research or investigation yeah, I, you know, it's it's been wild since since everything has sort of come full circle with with the the pandemic and and the constantly changing rules and and stuff like that. It, I, I think I, I think people what I've noticed the most anyway is that is that I, people are just wearing out and you know i think i think mental health has become more of an issue now i know at the beginning of uh, the pandemic as it was sort of starting to pick up last year uh you know people were, were were being you know sent home they're sitting at home they've got nothing to do their their heightened level of of fear 
um, was was very prevalent. And what ended up happening was that, you know, a lot of people were coming forward and saying, you know, OK, well, I'm having more activity in the house or they think they're having more activity. Um, you know, you've got this heightened sense of awareness of people both misdiagnosing things that were, you know, that they believe were paranormal, as well as people just being at home in that sort of heightened state and, and attracting more of that to them um, and having to notice it more because they couldn't go to work. They couldn't brush it under the rug anymore. Mm. Uh, you know, if their place was haunted before, well, now they have to sit in it. <laughs> and I think the, I, I think part of the, what, what's happened, uh, you know, for, for people like me is, you know, you've got a lot of people that have become far more aware uh, and they've got a lot more questions. So it's been, it's been really interesting to watch sort of the evolution of, of where we're, where the field has gone since this has started yeah i mean it is one of those interesting aspects of, of this i suppose it's going to be one of those periods in history because this has affected every country in every continent across the entire world where whenever we've had an interest in paranormal history and obviously you yourself morgan are obviously deeply ingrained in canadian paranormal history with your your great grandfather it's going to be interesting i think when we look back on this period of time maybe in a couple of years time or a decade even where we look at the whole concept of the paranormal and people's experiences has there been a big spike is it something that you've noticed a trend towards now as you refer to there that Basically, we've all been under house arrest for the best part of 12 months wherever we live in the world. So is it one of those things where, as you refer to, the little knocks and bangs and strange things that people perhaps didn't notice as they were rushing to get out the door to go and join the uh, the rat race? Now, as you say, everybody's been working from home. It's It's been in their faces. Has that brought us a new sort of revelation or amount of experiences coming forward? Well, it's it's interesting because it, depending on which side of the coin you kind of sit on, I, I think the I, I think the truth is kind of somewhere in the middle because uh, you know on one side investigators are saying, oh my God, there's been this massive increase in reports and in hauntings and and things like that, and then you've got the other side of the coin. Like there was a study done in Australia, I believe, where they attributed a lot of that to people being in a heightened state of of awareness and then starting to attribute everything to paranormal phenomena. And I think the truth is somewhere in the dead center um, where we've got a situation where you know people are are in fear and when they're in st uh, they're under stress uh, and they've got all these emotions going on whether it be anger or frustration or whatever it is oftentimes that is such a a kickstarter to psychokinetic activity pk activity where the energy is being projected essentially from the inside out um so yeah there's gonna be an a, a spike i think i think there has to be a spike um when you've got people and this amount of people under this amount of stress um i know uh, brian uh brian williams uh, a colleague of mine he's been monitoring the uh the rng the um uh, the uh, RNG experiments, so the Global Consciousness Project, where they're essentially using random number generators to um, detect spikes in consciousness and things like that throughout the world. And, I mean, there's been a number of events there where they've had spikes actually occur. So, I mean, I, I think there's, I think it's somewhere in the center of all of that. Yeah, I, I think it's one of those things that, as you say, because I've noticed a lot of people, strangely enough, there seems to have been a lot of reports about UFO sightings going through the roof in, in Canada and America and, and here in the UK, which I think is obviously, once again, every, you know, every, the, the furthest anybody can go is their back garden. So a lot of people have been sat outside yeah. watching things, probably to get away from the ghost in their kitchen, Morgan, I suspect. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I, I think it's one of those that when we look back at it i think it's going to be very interesting to see if we have anything similar to kind of the explosion of of interest in the paranormal that we had after the first world war and and the spanish flu outbreak because coupled with everything that's gone on we've also got a, a sadly mounting death toll around the world as well and a lot of people yes. taken unexpectedly for a, for a lot of people 18 months ago people simply were not expecting anything i mean and that sounds crazy to think that 18 months ago we were all blissfully ignorant about what 2020 had in store for us all yeah and i think what's what's interesting about i think about this um is people have really had well they've really had to examine 
the unknown on a level that the majority of people have not had to examine. I mean, we've been, you know, looking at sort of this, this transparent enemy that we can't see. And, uh, you know, as as I've spoken to people over, I, I do a live stream every week called Spiritual Healthcare, and I started that because I realized that there was a, a similarity between people dealing with these negative hauntings versus people trying to get their heads around a, a virus that they, they can't see. This isn't an enemy that we can go out and punch in the face, you know, and when I started to realize that, that people are grappling with the unknown in this in a very similar way that they are with 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 the paranormal. And, uh, you know, so it, it's caused people to have to really, really, really sit down and it, and do a really hard self inventory. You know, what's going on? How am I viewing the world? You know, do I think this world's a, a scary, fearful place? Do I think this is a friendly universe? How do I answer that question? And I think how people answer that question at the end of the day, is is really going to determine their you know their outlook and how they interpret and and bring in information whether it be a, you know about a virus or be a, about a negative haunting well yeah and i suppose there are some parameters there with with your book teaching the living morgan because what i found refreshing and deeply interesting is is your approach in regards to hauntings because as you refer to in the opening chapters of the book there seems to be a very negative connotation in regards to how hauntings are dealt with in popular culture especially certain tv shows they're never ghosts they're always demons they're always driving people out of their homes everybody's terrified and yet if you look back through the history of paranormal research and investigation it seems that there's been real change in how we view our interactions with the paranormal like most people would often refer to having a friendly ghost or or a spirit that just knocks stuff about and things and now lots of people seem to live above portals to hell it would seem <laughs> thank you media yeah <laughs> <laughs> but it's yeah it's, it's funny because um you know you you go to other cultures you, you start to look at other cultures um you know or places like, say, for example, like Okinawa, Japan, um, where that idea of this, you know, terrifying, horrible haunting, it's it's just really not a thing. It's like they don't dis discuss that type of thing. It's like, well, yeah, but, you know, you want to have that connection to the to the, the supernatural to that. I mean, that's the spirit world. You want that communication. You know, same thing with many of the First Nations cultures and things like that. You know, it's the idea of, of making it out to be this horrifying thing is just completely off the wall to them. And you, you, when you look statistically at in, encounters and people who have you know done the studies as to how it has uh, these paranormal encounters have actually made them feel it's up in the 80 percentile range of people that say this was the best thing that ever happened to me there this i had a wonderful experience but you know when you get into tv and stuff like that i mean fear sells and that's what they tend to go for and you know now we kind of have this weird stigma but when, when you start asking people their, their encounters are usually pretty pretty amazing yeah i mean it is something that obviously because of the other show i do the ghost story guys i'm seeing a lot more personal interactions and experiences and yes there are some that have, have left people feeling a bit afraid but there's also a lot of them where people seem to be more confused or intrigued by what's going on rather than being terrified out of their wits yeah yeah, exactly. And and I think that ability and the one thing I've tried to foster from very early on in, in my career, my 20 years of doing this, has been to look at this with with curiosity, replace the fear with curiosity, because if we can do that with the unknown, just in general, in our lives, we end up putting ourselves in a far better position to move forward in, in any area of our experience. And if we can look at things and say, hey, you know what, I can get curious about this, then we start asking questions, then we leave room for answers rather than trying to write a story, because we're so good at this as human beings writing a story about a thing that we don't really know about <laughs> well yeah obviously as with anything in in life morgan our brain will tend to fill the gaps oh it does and and we we tend to write our story in the same dialogue and in the same tense that we kind of write the rest of our lives like i've i've been a, a 
big fan of the concepts of journaling and things like that over the years. And when I've been doing uh, spiritual health care, so one thing I've had the people attending do is is keep a journal. And it was it was actually very recently I'd, I'd said to them, you know, go home and write out your story, write out your story and then read it back to yourself and see what you've what you've highlighted, how you've talked about it, you know, what how are you phrasing this? You know, what highlights of your life are you pulling out? Is it positive? Is it negative? You know, what's what's going on? Get a beat on how you're telling your story, because when you when you hear witnesses come in and, um, you know, and I hear it all the time on haunted hospitals and paranormal 911, you know, you read these people's stories and you can pretty much tell why they've had the experience they've had based on how they tell their story hmm. and it's, it's really interesting i think what is interesting as well one of the the aspects that you look at in your book and and the work that you do through entity seeker and and your live streams morgan is that hauntings are not a one-size-fits-all approach there are so many variations and reactions that people can have when they are having a paranormal encounter that i still find it surprising in this day and age that it seems that it's either good or bad and yet in my personal experience and um, through my reading investigating looking at the historical legacy of the paranormal over the last 100 150 years most of these experiences are quite ambivalent they're they're very nondescript most of them are bangings knocking strange noises occasionally and yet now it's it's good or bad. Yeah, it, it's really interesting how when 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 I'm listening to a witness or I'm, I'm I've got a you know a story that's come in through one of the shows or whatever, I really listen to what isn't being said when I'm I'm hearing these these individuals explain what's happened because the phenomenon for the for the most part you can categorize it into a number of a few different categories but for the most part I mean the phenomenon just is what it is I mean it doesn't <laughs> it isn't really one thing or another thing but depending on cultural belief depending on how you're raised depending on people's anxiety levels I mean it's just as it, it's vast the amount of variables you know they will they will write a a, a narrative <laughs> about what exactly has happened to them. And sometimes in order to, to really settle people down and, and get people to, to you know, really understand how they're perceiving their environment, they've got to sit down and start to look at what is constructed, what, did, what happened with them in their own minds versus the facts of what actually went on. And usually if there's a deviation. I mean, like you refer to in your book, and obviously in the conversations we've had previously, Morgan, it's very interesting especially for you, because you were brought up to believe that the paranormal, it was all frightening and scary, and therefore, when something happened, you had a fear-based response to that, regardless. Yeah. And in your book, you look at the fact that people's responses to things are usually based in reality, or their reality of their lives and their personal experiences in family and home and work, and therefore, that creates a preset idea of how someone is going to respond to something and it's about trying to change that thought process and that reaction i i surmise yeah exactly and it's it, that that really is the the premise of what i i try to get people to to understand which is the fact that our we really do on a very fundamental like particle level base of our being we really do have a choice as to what we are bringing into our environment there was a, a absolutely brilliant study by uh william roll uh it was i believe it was between it was around two it was in the last number of years of his life so around 2010 in there um and he ended up publishing a a, a number of works that, that i think were probably some of the best the, well, the best essays on on paranormal in paranormal research to date and you know he was he was basically bringing in theories of things like quantum entanglement um because it's now become inseparable from hauntings ghosts and hauntings at this point and you know it, what he was explaining was the fact that every single thing that we do everything we put our attention on 
is creating a new probability in our experience. And the more focus, the more energy that we point towards that thing, whether it's something we want or whether it's something we don't want, it, you know, the universe doesn't discriminate between either. And the more focus, the more momentum, the more emotion we put into something, the, the closer our, th those, that probability becomes to being reality. And when we start to understand that we have a role, we have a say – um, in in all of that, then it really starts to change the focus of, you know, is this a haunting problem or is this a person problem? And we got to start looking at the people because the other won't, you know, can't be perceived unless the person's perceiving it. Yeah, I think what I often find interesting as well, especially when we're talking about the paranormal or generally experiences that are outside of the normal parameters, be it seeing a UFO or a weird creature or just having a precognitive dream or something like that, Morgan, that I think it depends on, on the social construct you have around you, how you feel comfortable to reveal that and open yourself up. Because as is often in, in any aspect of the Fortean field, people are often scared of how they're going to be perceived or the reaction they're going to, to get when they open up about something that's happened to them that they can't explain. Oh, absolutely. And, and the stigma is real, like especially when you get into the, the medical field, you know, the professional field, any of that. The, the stigma is absolutely real. Um, you know, our amazing producers at Bristol Global Media who do uh, my two shows, they it takes a lot of work for them to get somebody to come forward on camera and say, hey, look, I'm a doctor this happened and I can't explain it. Here's what I think it was. Um, you know, they fear losing their jobs. They fear being marked as, as crazy. And, and I mean, it's not just, you know, professionals, but you know, if you've grown up in a, in a household that is, you know, staunchly religious or staunch, you know, towards one point of view or another, I mean, it's rough. You know, if you don't have that, that, nucleus of supporters around you to you know encourage and and explore that with you can be really tough yeah and i suppose that has a sort of underlying effect as well because it it can psychologically scar you because i suppose if you don't live or have a social circle where you're allowed to be yourself and be open and honest i would imagine that holding things in can be very damaging for some people Absolutely. And, you know, when and it, no matter what it is, you know, it, it can be so traumatic to be able to open yourself up on on whatever level that is and, you know, pour your heart out in in some way, like explain that experience or, you know, put yourself out there. And I mean, the number one fear of, of people in the world is rejection yeah. and to get rejected on on a level that is so fundamental, especially when it comes to the spiritual, because um, we are we are that energy and that rejection hurts as bad as it does because it really is rejecting a piece of who you are you know we are spirit we are that so to turn around and say no your perception is just wrong it's that's it's that's rough mm. yeah it, it is and I, I and, and i'm sure you you're fully aware of morgan and especially in the doing the work you do with the tv shows i would imagine that sometimes you will you will come across people that have perhaps kept something to themselves for for 10 years 15 years 20 years because they've had that initial reaction where something strange has happened they've told somebody and they've been laughed at or they've been oh well i think you need to go to the doctor you're clearly seeing things or hearing things and i don't understand why when we have a phenomenon that is as widely reported across the entire world, why people are still consistently dismissed out of hand that it's all in their minds. Well, and the thing is, it is highly a Western phenomenon that we do this. Mm. You know, when you go to these other countries and you're oftentimes you're not going to get that same rejection. As I say, you go to a place like Japan or you go to a place, you know, like uh, South America, places like that. In South America, they've got an entire program of professional psychologists and psychiatrists that will help people with their experiences and through the grieving process. You know, like it's it's really a Western issue where we tend to be like, oh, no, no you know, all that's crazy, you know, we, we dismiss it. And so even that in and of itself is is a cultural issue. Mm. And I think it's it's interesting. Yeah, and I think sometimes it can usually compound the grief process as well, because often people are searching for answers or trying to reach out to the other side or whatever it may be. 
as a as a way to try and find some closure, Morgan, and to make themselves feel whole again. Because whenever you lose anybody in, in life, it can often leave a hole that you feel that you're never going to be able to fill. And I think sometimes people search for answers or or to look for contact because they feel they need something filling inside them. Well, and I think not only that, but I think inherently we know that that connection is still available. And I, I you know, I think as as people, as just spiritual beings ourselves, you know, we're really hardwired for this. And so I think turning around and saying, oh, no, no, you can't. That person's lost. There's no chance anymore. You're never going to speak to them again. You know, is it's so it, it's so violent to to the soul, really, because who we are is uh, are people that are supposed to be, you know, connected with non-physical, with our higher senses, with the, you know, the ability to go sit and meditate and, and be able to get in touch with that, that non-physical energy and to turn around and say, no, 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 no you don't, you know, that, that doesn't exist, is really denying a, a part of who we are. Mm. You know, we, we're supposed to be able to do this. Yeah. And I think as well, one of the aspects of, of the paranormal that's always interested me is is smells or aromas, Morgan. And I, because in my experience, when I've spoke to people that have had these kind of experiences, especially when it comes to things like perfume or, or certain smells, uh, food or, or, or certain aromas that just remind them of a person, be, be what it may, the response that those people tend to have is usually very positive because that it seems to just take them somewhere where they feel happy or it reminds them and it takes them to a good place and i find that's one of the things that often gets overlooked when we talk about the paranormal as as one of the facets of, a, of an experience where like i say most people i've spoke to who have had that kind of experience it's been yeah. an extremely positive aspect of it for them Oh, absolutely. And, and I think, I think we're kind of hardwired because of, you know, media and ghost shows and stuff like that to think that the only way that we're going to see our loved one again or experience our loved one is through this, you know, miraculous apparition and they're going to come through the clouds and it's going to be this, <laughs> this great big event. And, and oftentimes it's, it's not that, you know, it's, it's these little things that start showing up and it resonates with people so deeply. And, you know, the universe has just a myriad of ways of of bringing your attention to certain things. And, yeah, it, it gets people get laughed at for it and, and whatever. But it's it are the, it's all these little things that that add up and you start to realize, you know, we're not alone. Mm. And I think often as well, when you have a fragrance or an aroma that arrives very often there is no plausible explanation for it i know of a personal experience where uh, quite close to myself that someone had passed away and unfortunately they'd been extremely ill um, and therefore they were using ulbus oil to try and soothe their symptoms morgan mm -hmm. and sadly they'd passed away and then about three months later these people were, were laid in bed and this aroma came into their bedroom at 4 a.m and it was of such a magnitude that it woke them it was that strong but the general reaction to that was one of of calmness of happiness of better times yeah. and the interesting aspect was that one of the people that experienced that was a 100 percent died in the wool it's all nonsense skeptic and the only thing they said about it was i think someone came to visit us last night and that was the end of the conversation yeah and, and it's such it's such a beautiful experience i know my, myself uh when my my business partner stephanie was was still alive mm. i remember the one day going over to her uh, uh she had a she lived in a, a condo building that had some meant walls and insulation i mean this thing was just so insulated you weren't going to get a smell or anything like that from anywhere yes. and i remember coming down the hallway and i opened the the door to her place and what hit me like a brick was the smell of incense and it was thick like it mm. <laughs> it was so thick and i was like steph <laughs> what are you doing like <laughs> you need to open a window what are you doing and she she came out and she said you're well you're never going to believe this she's like there hasn't been one stick of incense lit in here and she said i have no idea what this is <laughs> and within about five minutes of that it dissipated and it was gone as fast as it came but it, i mean it hit you like a wall uh when you came in but like we 
he had stuff like that going on going on all the time uh, when when she was still alive. And it, 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 you're right, it is. It usually is very uplifting, mm. and you. Di- I think there's a presence that comes with it that is really undeniable as well. It's not usually it's not just a smell. There, there's a there's something else there, and and we know it. Mm. Mm. it. It is like I say in my experience with people, and and and, and as you refer to them, it does tend to be a very uplifting experience for the people that that go through that. Yeah, and it just reminds us that there's so much more that we're not interpreting with our senses. Our senses are so limited. Yeah, I mean, it's little things like that that always make me smile because often it seems to be when people really need that kind of boost as well, I think, when when they're going through the grief process. And I know some people might think it's some kind of placebo effect, but once again, these aromas and situations will often occur where there is no possible explanation for for a smell that is completely alien and and unavailable in that property or, or that person's locality that it suddenly washes over them. And it's little things like that coupled with things like people will sometimes stumble across white feathers for some reason or a white feather will flut, flutter down from the yeah. ceiling when they're perhaps thinking of someone and um, here in the UK we have a, a tradition of robins coming to see people to sort of, of remind them and and that's one of those things that often makes me smile when I hear primarily because once again the the people seem to really resonate with that kind of and it may seem like a very little thing, but I think the emotional impact it has on people just does more, far more good than a lot of people could possibly imagine, I suspect. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, our the, the way that we can move through the world when we know that there is something larger going on that is is so drastically different. You know, you talk to people who don't have that connection for whatever reason, whether they're just, you know, a, a complete hardcore skeptic or they just, you know, very materialistic or, you know, whatever it is going on with them. It's it's interesting to hear the difference in in speak and in attitude between the people who have found that connection, no matter how they found it, um, and the people that just that don't have it, and how they deal with life situations when they when they hit rough spots. It's really different. Um, even their grieving processes are extremely different. You know, where one kind of comes out the other end with with hope, and the other one feels like you know that's it, that's the end, and they're questioning their own mortality. Like it's it's really interesting. Mm. Mm. And I think it's one of those things as well, because it, it's a very traditional aspect of the paranormal. And I think it's one of those things that even to this day, one of the things I've often been impressed with the way you investigate and, and research these things, Morgan, is that you tend to be able to, to utilize the scientific with the spiritual and bring them together sort of hand in hand. Because I'm always interested in whenever you share something or whenever you're talking about something, because you're one of the people who who does so much academic research in regards to the paranormal and the, the concepts of consciousness and how the world around us is, a, is an ever-changing thing, that often when you look at normal... Well, if you can be normal, if you're classed as a paranormal investigator, because you're not really dealing with normal situations. Um, <laughs> it's probably not it's the true. best term. <laughs> um, but it's, it, I find it remarkable that we still have so many people that use old-fashioned methods. You know, we've still got people who will swear blind by using Ouija boards and table tipping and uh, a psychic connection. Whereas as science has moved on and our understanding of of the world around us i think it's it's frustrating that a lot of it seems rooted in things we were doing a hundred years ago yeah i I have the same frustration and it's it's interesting to watch because you know when you when you delve into the current works you know people like stanley krippner um you know dr nancy zingroni like the azire institute Mm. winbridge institute you know all these people that are, are doing this high level intensive academic stuff a lot of the things that these, I guess, you know, call them ghost hunters or, or whatever, like so the people that aren't as, as invested in the, the science side of it, you know, they're trying to come up with all these explanations when these explanations are already done. And if, like, and so for me, that's, that's what's really frustrating where like, say, for example, you know, the, the concept of, of residual energy, this idea that environments can play back this, you know, these images, sights, sounds, uh, whatever, um, from history, you know, there was, a, there was a book recently put out, which I highly recommend to everybody to, to pick it up if they can afford it is advances in parapsychological research, 10th edition. And 
you know, they're going into how this works. Like, how does, re- how does residual energy happen? What's going on on a quantum level that explains what's happening? And it's like, okay, well, now we've, we've moved ahead from the idea that there's, you know, some spirit that's stuck in a place that's not the case you know we've answered and and are answering some of these questions already but it seems like the 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 vast majority of people that are into this stuff they really don't get in enough to where science is sitting on it now Hmm. um thinking that science is just denying this stuff well it's not you know it's it's coming up with root explanation by parapsychologists that are, are brilliant and that information's not being I, I think it's just not being uh distributed in a way that that people are willing to sit down and you know really delve into it's not light reading by any chance but you know <laughs> it's but it but it's needed reading yeah absolutely and i think it's one of those preconceived ideas that for a lot of people parapsychology finished in the 1990s as an academic endeavor and you're fantastic at, at uncovering all kinds of wonderful pieces of research and experiments that are going on around the world, Morgan, and, and sharing them and, and pointing people in the right directions to find out. Because as you say, I think unless you look for it, it can be quite difficult to kind of put your finger on who's doing what and where. But then when you read your work and, and other people uh, around the world, there does seem to be a real growth in this academic investigation again which i think is once again we seem to have gone through that stigma process that we got through the 90s and and early noughties morgan and i think we're getting to a point now where there are so many academic facilities out there now that a lot of them have just gone well to hell with it you know this is a very interesting aspect and and not necessarily just looking for ghosts i think they're looking at perhaps the psychological aspect of what a paranormal experience is is it a conscious construct that's going on is it something that we're unaware of perhaps what john keel would refer to in regards to his ultra terrestrials yes are there things pushing through from another dimension whatever that might be i think because what we know scientifically about the world around us in 2021 is infinitely far more than we even could have possibly considered in in 1990 when you look at the expansive experimentation across a wide variety of fields especially when it comes down to things such as quantum theory and and those kind of aspects and the interdimensional growth that seems to have occurred over the last 20 years because you know if you'd have said to me 30 years ago that people would be discussing the the real possibility that there's more than one dimension on a on a scientific and academic level i'd have laughed at you i would have said there would be no yeah. concept that this would be being pushed and yet here we are where people are really are searching for these answers to perhaps subjects that they they don't want the answer to perhaps well yeah and i think that that is a big question because i mean here we've got basically every top university in the world has a parapsychology lab i mean princeton has pair yale um they've they've opened uh, a program Oxford, all of these universities, Edinburgh, um, you know, UCLA, all of these places have opened these parapsychology labs and, and have made grandiose advances. So it drives me crazy when I hear, you know, skeptics and stuff turn around and say, well, you know, that's just not study. That's that's a load of crap. Like it absolutely is. It's it's top of the line with so many different universities, but they ignore it. And I think, you know, when we, we talk about things like, um, you know, the, like you were saying, the delving into this new angle of, of quantum theory, you know, the personal experience and have and people's experience and people's consciousness, how we are interpreting consciousness and the fact that all of these occurrences are going on around people. I mean, these things are without a doubt intertwined hmm. and we can't look at one without the other. The idea of, of consciousness, you know, that are, again, the hard problem, as David Chalmers talked about, is consciousness fundamental or is an emergent? Hmm. And the more we begin to really understand how much people have an influence over their experience, one of the things that William Roll talks about extensively in, in his work is the idea of quantum entanglement, where no matter what we interact with, no matter what we touch, no matter what we are, are doing, we are leaving traces of ourselves on a very fundamental like particle and atomic level with every single thing that we're going that that we're interacting with and and touching so things like psychometry things like psychic readings things like um residual energy 
all intertwines because you've got people who are leaving traces of themselves everywhere. So it's like we can't look now at paranormal phenomenon without going, holy crap, we as living beings are a part of this. We're a part of it. Yeah. And I mean, I always work on the principle of, even on a very basic level, Morgan, that we are energy. And as far as I'm aware, Definitely. energy cannot be destroyed. It can only be converted into something else. So yeah. even on a basic level such as that, that alone is worthy of investigation. Whatever it goes, wherever, wherever we go, wherever it, you know, maybe it, we just drift away into the into the universe around us. But it goes somewhere, and I think that alone is is an avenue that really needs to continue to be pushed, and the boundaries of research keep moving forward in regards to that because it's it's a very interesting aspect of that that still gets overlooked. That when you have people like Einstein who explain these theories and and the understanding of how energy works in the universe. I find it very odd that here we are 80 years later and people just don't want to talk about that aspect of this. Yeah, and I wonder often, like I, as many people throughout the years as I've, I've spoken with, whether it be at classes or lectures or whatever, um, what I find really interesting is that you – you know, they'll come up to you and they'll say, you know, well, I don't believe in any of this. So you say, you know, you'll, you'll counter them with something and eventually you get to the point where they're not necessarily making an argument for, for their position anymore. They just can't handle it. It's like, I can't look at that and they have to walk away or they, they, they just hit a point. And I think, I think for a lot of people, the struggle is, that when you don't have a foundation in some sort of spirituality, whether it be connecting with nature or con connecting with yourself or connecting with source or whatever it is for you, I think when you, when you lose that, then if you place something that is unknown or unexplainable or something that doesn't fit into that person's world paradigm, it becomes a situation where they have to rewrite the paradigm of how they're looking at the world. And that's a huge job. And when we talk about things like like paradigm shifting, because I think right now everybody's going through it on some level somewhere in their experience because of everything that's been going on, mm. we have really got to, you know, sit down and examine what it is that maybe our paradigms, maybe they're just not correct in certain areas. And I mean, I've had to do it a million times, but I think I think that's where skeptics and, and people like that tend to fall off the rails because it, we're not just asking them to go, oh, no, this is a possibility. If they accept that's a possibility, they have to rewrite the paradigm of how they walk through the world. And it's it can be a bigger jump for some people than others. Yeah, or you could be like certain skeptics who every cryptid case, it's just people mistakenly seeing owls everywhere. Yeah, and that's that's the easy explanation, you know, like they can get their head around an owl yes. because that's part of their world paradigm. But if you turn around and say, you know, no, like this is this is clearly like I've, I've got the fingerprints of a, of a great ape here. They're going to look at that. And because that doesn't fit into that structure immediately, it has for them, it has to be that misidentification, even though the misidentification excuse oftentimes is is more ridiculous than the idea of of something being encrypted. Uh, you know, like, the odds of this thing being an owl is zero. <laughs> like, but they will fight you to the death on it. And it's it's really interesting, you know, when when sometimes the, you know, the easier of the two explanations is look like this is possibly a great ape that we don't know about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there there are numerous aspects across all fields in regards to this, and and it's not just skeptics oh. that that have these preconceived ideas. Some people will will push any old nonsense as as evidence of paranormality. Um, oh, without a doubt. A, a prime example of that is that the certain people that are using these kinetic stickman cameras. Morgan, which mm -hmm. uh, a friend of mine who's a very well-known paranormal investigator uh, sent me some footage of his flat the other week and he basically found out that he'd got a ghost living in his fridge dancing using one of these kinetic things and he found it hilarious that anybody would try and put that forward as evidence of a paranormal yeah. experience because he says it's clearly some kind of electronic response that's showing a ghost dancing on his fridge. Yeah. And yet, yeah, it's 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 wild. And yet, and yet, I mean, I remember the other week I was flicking through the channels and came across a paranormal show, and they were going nuts about this kinetic evidence as mm -hmm. proof that there were ghosts running about all over the place in this particular property. And you just think it's so easy to to disprove, and yet 
it continues to be put forward as, as evidence of the paranormal when the only thing it seems to be evidence of is the gullibility of, of the audience. Well, and that's the fr- frustrating part, I think, for, for anybody in this field, because there's so much good evidence out there that when I think this is one of the only scientific realms where hoaxes are a problem. You know, you, you get into you get you get into the I don't know, the realm of atoms or, you know, you start talking about, you know, this, that or the or nature or this, that or the other thing, you know, how a tree grows, somebody's not gonna hoax how a tree grows. Okay. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> cares. You know <laughs> No one's going to hoax that where with something like, you know, say Sasquatch or, or, you know, the Orang Pendek or something like that, you know, somebody will go out there and, and fake a bunch of footprints or have, you know, somebody run in front of the camera or whatever. And so it undermines all of the, the people who study this that, you know, our zoologists, our hominologists are, it just completely screws them up in the, in the view of the public because these skeptics see that and go, you know, you call this evidence. This is ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. I, I find it frustrating because I know enough about the standard history of science to know that all aspects of science have had massive hoaxes by very well-educated scientists. And what I find frustrating is when it's something like the paranormal or cryptozoology or ufology, people will constantly focus on the hoax, the hoax, the hoax. And yet when we have very well researched and investigated hoaxes in chemistry and physics and other aspects of the of the scientific history people just seem to move on and forget about them and i i find it very pecu- i find it very peculiar that it depends on the discipline how long the hoax tends to be continually mentioned if you know what i mean it's it's almost as if when something tends to happen in what's classed as a normal scientific endeavor people quickly move on and nobody wants to talk about it when it happens in something else it is constantly referred to all the time yeah it's it, and and it's a problem because you know people they i think people are becoming more critical about the information that they're getting, which is good um, in, a, in a lot of ways. But I think the problem is, is it comes back again to, to that world paradigm where we are, you know, if, if it disrupts the paradigm of what we think the world looks like, it, people struggle with it, where the idea of, oh, well, this is just a hoax and, you know, it's bad media or it's whatever. Well, that makes more sense to them because they can fit that into to what's going on. And I think part of the problem, too, is that you've got people who just kind of want to that the people out there that kind of want to see like, not necessarily the world burn, but they kind of want us to stick it to the the people above them you know, or the scientists or the whatever, like they kind of want to see that get screwed up somehow. Like it's it's inter- it's interesting, and I've noticed that just even with the pandemic over the last year and a half, um, like we see that constantly, where you know people are are you know taking what they're you know they'll take a bit of misinformation and they'll just blow it up. And I think where we've got you know we we come back to something like like the paranormal, you know the we we get these little tidbits here and there, and it, you know if if it seems like a hoax for somebody or you know they can prove that it's a hoax, then you know it's a little bit of power that they get back. Uh, um, you know, where it's like, well, I can explain this now. You know, I can explain this. So therefore, it's yeah, it's a problem. Yeah, yeah. Don't ever mention the pill down, man. That's all I'll say. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> never happened. No, let's move on. Um, <laughs> but that's one of those things. Archaeology, especially, is full of people finding <laughs> things and paleontology. Oh, totally. As well. um, and you know, physics people are often claiming to have discovered the cold fusion, especially, is something that seems to pop up every ten years and yes. then quickly disappears appears again and, and back into it to where it's gone and nobody what talks about it again so it is it is a little bit frustrating that as with anything as we as, as we say it works both ways I, I mean i've i've seen paranormal investigations that claim to be the most groundbreaking investigation into a poltergeist haunting here in the uk and they made numerous claims about all this evidence and yet didn't take any photos of them at yeah. all and and i found that incredible that if you had these objects which were apparently physically manipulated and damaged in such a way that it could only have allegedly been paranormal, why on earth would you not film that? Why on earth would you not take photos of that? You would be shouting from the rooftops. Yeah, I think that's another massive problem with 
with a lot of the sort of the amateur side of of this um, is the fact that, you know, whether they just, you know, don't have the money for that type of like full on camera setup or they just they're not thinking about it or, you know, whatever it is that, you know, if you come forward with a piece of evidence and say, I saw blah, 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 and you don't have anything to 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 build that up around it then you're just another person that saw that thing <laughs> and so it's like okay yeah like we could say that too but you know we're now at this point where i mean everybody has a camera everybody and i mean granted a lot of this stuff happens so fast that if you if you don't the odds of you you know filming something if you don't have your camera out already sometimes is zero i mean i have enough trouble getting i mean my python does funny things and funny tricks and stuff like that and i get like 15% of them on my phone, but, <laughs> you know, but it's, but in, in the paranormal is kind of like that too. I mean, I've definitely had instances where, you know, something has happened and like, I'm looking at it and it takes me a second to figure out, Oh my God, this is something I need to be filming. But I mean, if you're in a, a full scale house like that, where, you know, everything's going on, you've got a study set up. I mean, there's no reason you shouldn't have a camera in every damn room, you know, everything being monitored, everything locked down. Um, you know, so if, if you don't do that, it, really is just sort of a, a dent in your own credibility as a, as a researcher. Yeah, especially when you claim to have got the, the remnants of this incident as well, and you still don't take a picture of it. I mean, what? how can you possibly put that forward as evidence and then not supply the evidence that proves what you're saying is right, you know? Well, and then that's the problem, and we uh, we saw a similar, uh, similar story but bus, um, unfold like the Minnesota Iceman yeah. was kind of like that, you know, where it's like, here you've got, you know, this guy saying, oh, you know, we've got evidence, we've got evidence of, of this, this Yeti type creature. And then all of a sudden it disappears or it's replaced or it's, you mm. know, whatever. And you're going, okay, well, what's going on here? Like, <laughs> you know, if, you, if you've got this, then, then what, what's the problem? And I, I always go back to the old adage, people who have nothing to hide, hide nothing. I always start to, to look at them a little cockeyed after that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a prime example because what was, <laughs> I mean, the replacement doesn't look anything like the, the alleged no. pictures that were taken by, um, I think it was Sanderson and um, uh, Hulemans who, who took yeah. the pictures of the original investigation, Morgan. And then strangely enough, I saw Ken Gerhard on TV. Yes. Uh, I think it was In Search of Monsters and that he'd got was. The, yep. the chap who owns the, the replica in his museum in Texas, I think it is. And, um, yeah. and it looks nothing like it. No, I mean, there was, there was missing pieces. There was, I mean, the, the teeth weren't right. The face wasn't right. I mean, it was, yeah. I mean, <laughs> and, and it's, it's funny because, you know, people will, will kind of take that and, you know, try to work it into their imagination that it's something that it isn't. And, you know, it's, it's funny if you, you know, parade people in front of something and then, you know, have them recite back to you what they think they saw. Mm. It's like night and day. Uh, there was a really awesome experiment done um, by uh, Ayanla Van Zandt, who ended up, she had, it was, I think it was four women that she was, she was coaching and each one of them uh, had a different version of, of a sexual assault that had gone on. And she did this experiment where she had each one of them describe back to her a chaotic scene that she had kind of play out with actors where they were running around and ringing bells and whatever. And the, they were probably doing this for maybe, I don't know, 10 seconds. And the actors run out and she gave them all a piece of paper and said, write down how many people they were, what they looked like, male, female, what was it? And they couldn't even get the number of people right. <laughs> it was really, it was really wild. But, you know, and, and her whole point was, you know, just because, you know, you think you've got a perception that is, that is right, doesn't mean it's right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And memory is a strange thing as well, because as, as we touched on earlier on, Morgan, your memory can sometimes change things, move things around. You can, you can, I, I've had it happen a couple of times where I've been absolutely adamant that a, a really, important event has occurred on a specific day at a specific time and I was doing a specific thing obviously before the internet you just basically worked so whether you you know you convince yourself that that's what you were doing and that's why it happened and that's what was happening and yeah. yet on both occasions I'm thinking of two personally speaking off the top of my head when I went back one the event itself happened 
but what I was doing prior to the event was completely wrong. It hadn't happened in the way I thought I was watching something and that was the reason I had decided not to do something before this event occurred. Everything I thought I'd done was wrong. None of that had happened, but the event still occurred on the same date at the same time. The same thing happened. But my understanding of the build-up and why I was doing something prior to it was completely wrong. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting what our what our minds will do. I, I was always laughing at my uh, my my mom and dad for for years. They had this argument going on that uh, my dad was absolutely convinced that on their first date, my mom wore this this pair of pants, this pinstripe pair of pants, and this pinstripe coat mm. and he was like 100 percent convinced of this and my mom is like i never owned that <laughs> like i never owned one like it just happened. <laughs> you couldn't tell him like you could not tell him differently so i still don't know whether this coat <laughs> this like outfit existed but <laughs> but both of them would like they were ab- are absolutely adamant like they'll look you dead in the eye about this right but it's it's really it's really funny as to see you know what people think versus what actually occurs it's usually quite opposed to the truth the truth is usually somewhere in the middle yes absolutely but that i think that applies to all aspects of this uh, as well morgan once again because something that you've touched on earlier about keeping journals and things like that is whenever you're involved or experiencing something keeping a record of anything that occurs is is one of the first things you must do purely for your own as we've just touched on there memory is not infallible it can be wrong yep. it can change yep. it can tell you something that happened that never happened or is a very strange version of the reality of what occurred so when you're dealing with hauntings and, and trying to assist people who may be having an experience would you say that keeping a journal keeping a record is imperative for having an honest evaluation of of what on earth they may be going through yeah it's, it's crucial and uh you know one of the things i always tell people you know is is try you try to write a timeline down as best you can but to make sure that you you kind of you keep that timeline and not only of the event itself but the things that were going on that day, you know, what has had stressed you out that day? Were there any, you know, major things that happened? Were there any major, you know, ups, downs, you know, whatever, um, so that you can get an idea of the pattern, the emotional pattern of, of the people, because our emotions are really are tied to so much of this, you know, to, to really get an understanding of, of how people live their daily experience. Because once you get a handle on that you can usually figure out where the paranormal activity is either stemming from or what is allowing it to persist i mean do you think that sometimes i've i've heard this mentioned by other paranormal investigators over the years morgan that there are certain dynamics situations stresses occurrences in normal life that can create the right ingredients for either something to occur or something to latch on to them. Yeah, undoubtedly. I mean, the uh, idea of of psychokinesis at this point has become has become almost you know almost a guarantee. I mean, with the the research that's been going on, uh, you know, over the last number of years, you know, William Roll being one um, among many many others. You know, the idea that we are those those emotions, especially especially the negative emotions, it, uh, interesting enough, are very heavily tied to to psychokinesis. And but even just in general, when it comes to to haunting, so an intelligence that's wandering around a property that's that's uh you know outside of the the living person, when we start to look at the the, the people and how they are living on a day to day basis, how they're thinking, you know, whether they're on sort of that positive end of the emotional spectrum versus the the negative end most of the time, um, that is it clearly becomes reflected in the type of uh, paranormal phenomenon, haunting and phenomenon that they experience. It's it's almost undeniable when you you know you start to talk to these families as to what's going on, and you start to realize that well, hold on, like. You know, sometimes the haunting is actually a reflection of a trauma that's been unhealed by a person that's experiencing it. Um, I had one case where it was a, a young mother and she, her family was having a terrible time with a, a negative entity and it was, it was attacking her and, you know, biting her and scratching her and this, that and the other thing. And, um, the husband was almost always untouched. It had great respect for the husband. And when we started to dig into what was going on, she had, a lot of 
unresolved, unhealed crap from the relationship she had gotten out of prior to marrying her husband. Hmm. Um, the guy was physically abusive. He was, I mean, he was a direct reflection of what she was now experiencing again. And she had done nothing to clean that up. Um, mm. when she ended up, uh, you know, getting herself into some therapy and getting herself, you know, moving forward, then she ended up seeing a reduction in what was going on. But it was, it took healing that to get her into a better place, um, so that this could settle down. It's, I mean, I, I think our emotional involvement and, and how we deal with those unhealed emotions um, is is critical. And and on the flip side, you know, the people that are are bipping around and having you know a pretty good life and they're they're dealing with stress and they're you know having a pretty good time, you know, they're having incredible experiences that I mean are just amazing. And I mean, it's the stuff you want. I think it is one of those preconceived ideas, especially when it comes to poltergeist cases as well, Morgan. That a lot of people tend to focus on certain notable cases around the world that all seem to have the right ingredients which is a a family unit that has either fallen apart or is under extreme stress teenage girls usually or girls yep. coming into puberty and going through that the, the physical and, and mental changes that, that that brings with itself and often focus on the fact that well clearly this is child's cry for help or or simply attention seeking because obviously according to some people all poltergeist cases are fakes by uh, extremely talented teenage girls who seem to be the best magicians on the planet in certain cases and um, they've completely forgotten that they were once teenagers and were they good magicians at that age <laughs> most, <I'm> not. <laughs> most teenagers can't lie properly never mind anything else morgan um, <laughs> You know, come home smelling the smoke. Have you been smoking? No, no, not at all. Yes. Things like that. You know, you can't even get that right. So I don't know how you can, you know, fly objects around. Anyway, but often, especially when you dive into that subject, especially poltergeists, the vast majority of cases, there aren't these negative aspects of it that you would say creates a subject i mean obviously here in the uk a big series that's just been a massive success is danny robbins's fantastic the battersea poltergeist which yeah. which a lot of people have once again said well you know the teenage girl was obviously behind all of it regardless and yet there are certain aspects of that that make that nobody tries to explain away or they just said no the people are wrong or all the witnesses are wrong they're all exaggerating none of them are remembering it correctly and you just think i mean that's a very wide kind of catch to kind of go at it yeah. with them say basically everybody who's talking about this is wrong they all exaggerated everything none of it happened down they think it did and it's all psychological and yet the vast majority of these cases we don't have these damaged family units we don't have these stresses most poltergeist cases don't involve a teenage girl and yet if you ask most people to talk about them they will mention enfield amherst and others like that yes. because that fits the criteria yeah and it's and like you were saying i mean this stuff it doesn't have to contain a level of negativity it, it just doesn't and the majority don't in fact you know when you you get into the studies that have been done over the years at the, especially the different universities and things like that the people who do better on pk or or psi tests um you know esp tests anything like that they are typically the ones who are the most relaxed Mm -hmm. They're the most open minded. They're the most positive. Um, you know, they're the ones who can slip into meditation quite easily because they're usually the ones that are the receiver of what they would call the receiver in the experiment. But yeah, like, I mean, the people who typically experience this stuff, there is a personality type, <laughs> believe it or not, that is more prone to it. And it's usually the people that are more outgoing. They're, they're more open minded. They, they kind of live a, you know, relatively happy experience and, and they are a little bit more open to mysteries and things that are, are happening. So, um, yeah, like the idea that, you know, all of this has to be, you know, this, this horrible, negative, dark energy is just, that's just not true. Statistically, it's just not true. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was talking to someone recently in regards to uh, a couple of other cases and a, a mutual friend of ours, Richard Estep, um, famously yep. investigated, uh, the black monk of Pontefract. And there's one of those, I mean, that's another case where we've got teenage girl, working class family in the north of England, a bit stressed, 
as as most people were in in the north in the 60s up here um <laughs> but there are aspects of that case that people just completely ignore one of the prime examples is somebody comes around to their house morgan who thinks it's all nonsense and the and the kids are playing up as she sits at the kitchen table and tells everybody that she thinks it's nonsense a jug of milk comes out of the fridge and is poured over her head now are we expecting because the kids aren't there the kids didn't report this the adults did so either it happened or they're all lying which is it yeah because you can't pin that on kids faking it so where are we supposed to go with things like that and when when you get cases like that Enfield is a prime example where they just say, oh, well, it was it was the two girls and, and that's all it is to it. And it ignores things like the police seeing a chair fly across the kitchen when the kids were in the room with them, weren't even yep. there. You know, a cast iron fire being ripped out of a wall. Apparently an 11-year-old with a crowbar can, can do that, I've seen people say, which I find <laughs> remarkable because um, I think I'd struggle with a crowbar now. And I'm, I'd like to think I'm slightly stronger than an 11-year-old girl, <laughs> even from North London. Um, and it's and it's those kind of aspects where, yeah, you know, you could see people pretend to bounce about in the bed and say, oh, there's a ghost in my room. Fine. But when you ignore those kind of aspects, I think it, that's very frustrating because, once again, that's latching onto things that are easily explainable and the things that can't be explained or make you question the reality of, of what you believe simply seem to be ignored yeah people have to really get their head around the idea that science is a tool yeah it is not a bible and i think oftentimes what people in in these situations specifically will do is you know they'll pick up a a you know, a textbook from the nineties and or something like that. And they're, you know, they're just like, Oh no, I, you know, I can't explain this. This, this doesn't exist. This doesn't happen. Well, no, no, no. Hold on a minute. Like the whole purpose of scientific investigation is the evolution of scientific investigation. Yes. You know, this stuff is continuously morphing. It's continuously evolving. And, you know, like I was saying with the, the, you know, the, recent advances the the book i was reading um advances in parapsychological research 10 um i mean where we are compared to where we were even even five years ago is is massive um the the advances are huge and so when they turn around and they're like oh no no, this isn't explainable you know so often it's like yeah well at one time gorillas weren't explainable either Mm. you know it's at one point a gorilla was a cryptid you know, it was a joke and it was, you know, paraded around the the world as a, as a joke. You know, oh, they're saying these great big eight men exist in Africa. It's ridiculous, right? <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, well, now go to a zoo. I can see a gorilla. So, uh, you know, and I, it's it's the same thing with, with this stuff where it's like, you know what, the, this is like a constant evolving process. And if you're c- continuously going back and saying this doesn't exist, this doesn't exist, it's, uh, you know, you are literally beating a dead horse. You know, if, if people are looking at things like the Enfield and just like, oh, this can't happen. Well, that, that's wrong. <laughs> it's just, just wrong. Um, you know, this stuff can happen. It's been documented. It has happened. Now the question is why? Mm, absolutely. I mean, I'm one of those that you know, I'm I'm not somebody that will say, oh, well, it's definitely a disembodied spirit that's responsible. I think there are numerous realities at play here, Morgan. And I think, yes. once again, coming, coming at it from the paranormal side, it's not a one-size-fits-all on that end either. And I don't not suspect all. that all poltergeist cases are ghosts coming in. Clearly, there is some kind of energy release. And, you know, I'm not going to say that if somebody disagrees with me they're wrong i personally think more cases are to do with some kind of pk release whatever it is why ever it's released than anything to do with a disembodied spirit and it may be some kind of unconscious creation that's going on and why that goes on we're not sure but i think yeah that's as valid a reason for it to simply say, oh, well, all poltergeist cases are caused by ghosts, when, you know, there are numerous cases where there are no children involved at all. So, well, it can't be kids then. No, exactly. And and what's, what's been really interesting, too, because one of the big arguments uh, in, in regards to PK has been, well, what happens when, you know, something happens and that person isn't even home? Mm. And what they've discovered is the fact that these PK responses can actually be delayed. Yeah. And and just like energy can be delayed in release, 
and they, they, they know, they've known this for, for decades, PK is, is subject to those same physical laws. And that's been really intriguing. They've also discovered that the idea of um, uh, distance will affect whether or not an object goes three feet versus 15 feet. Um, you know, it like almost like the, the example that I, I, I use to teach people is, is, you know, if you think of a bathtub full of water and you start pouring cold water into, into a, a tub of hot water, that it's going to be the coldest right where that water is hitting. And as it disperses, the water starts to warm up. And it's kind of the same thing with PK, where it's like the, you know, the closer that person or whatever is to, or that source of the energy, whatever the source of the energy is to the object, um, the closer it is in proximity, the further that object's going to go, and then it's going to dissipate as it disappears. Um, so, you know, there's, there's so much to it. And you're totally right. Like the idea of labeling just everything as a ghost is, we're just, we're past that. We're just yeah. past that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that is another important aspect because when we start to talk about these subjects, often people will presume or, or expect you to be in one of two camps. It's either not a ghost or a ghost. Yeah. And I'm tending to be, not that I'm trying to sit on the fence, Morgan, but I think it's nothing like that simple. Yeah. Well, and you're, you're right. Um, you know, and we're seeing study after study after study explain exactly that is that we've got aspects of this world that, I mean, nothing we, we are involved in is black and white. Nothing. And, you know, we, we want to, so many times I think people want to think that st this stuff is, is asserted on us, you know, rather than us being a part and an, and an interactive part of, of the stuff that's happening. Um, but we are. And, uh, and I think part of the, the issue that a lot of people end up having is that when you have to own the fact that you are a part of whatever it is that's going on, that ownership can be really rough on people. Hmm. They don't want it to be a degree. They, they don't want to have a degree in, a, in participation because if they're blaming, it's easier to point a finger. Mm. So, you know, part of the challenge with, I know for myself with a lot of investigations, is to get people to understand that it's not about blame and it's not about fault. It's about understanding that we are an integral part of all the things that are going on. And we have to sit and look at ourselves because we can't control the entity that's out there. We can't. It's going to do what it's going to do. But what we do have is control over ourselves, control over our mind. We have the ability to discipline and, and work it from that angle. And if we can do that, then, you know, we can, we can make an impact and, a gr and create a greater understanding. Mm, absolutely. I think that's the key aspect here is don't prescribe yourself to a, a preconceived explanation utilize all the information at hand and don't dismiss it either side of it as not being what you want it to be because often as with anything morgan people will tend to try and whether they mean to or not if you believe in a certain aspect and you think well it has to be paranormal or it has to be faking you already have a preconceived bias and therefore whatever you find whatever result you get you will tend to focus on the ones that will lead you to the result that you want and i don't think that works for anybody no and what makes it worse is that you know when you when you factor in how a lot of this quantum entanglement and and quantum pers this perspective works is that you will create the results that you were, you expect, which makes it really tough too. You know, you look at something like, for example, like the, the double slit experiment where, you know, you're just, you're trying to figure out whether or not you could have, you know, particles and waves going on at the same time. And, and literally it's, it's so interesting because the people that are focused on the idea of, you know, seeing that light in a waveform, well, they get a waveform. If they see it in a particle form, they'll get a particle form. Um, and <laughs> it's like, so at that point, it's like, well, okay, now what? Like, now what do we do and and we so we really are creating our reality on on so many levels um and we do get what we expect you know the people that are typically like you know i don't believe in this nothing ever happens to me well usually nothing happens to them that's what makes them frustrating <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and, and everybody else is going but i've seen and they're just like well i've never seen anything i've had people you know living in the same house that have you know one person's experiencing all this stuff and the other person's like fast asleep beside them and doesn't wake up mm -hmm. you know it's it's crazy but it, it happens and it's it's infuriating but <laughs> it's like you know if you've got the the 
that that expectation that it's like all oh, this stuff doesn't happen to me well you're going to create that yeah absolutely and i suppose that often leads us to that kind of situation where you can have multiple people in a situation morgan and maybe one of them has an experience and that often makes you think well is that some kind of response to an environmental energy or is it something that is affecting them in an electrical way in regards to how their brain responds to the information that's around them that other people may not be picking on because you know with the greatest respect everybody is different and everybody responds to different stimuli in in different ways yes most people will have certain responses that are fairly normal but there will always be extremes on either end of a spectrum who will have either a, a very powerful response or nothing will occur to them at all yeah and, and where it gets really tricky when you really d delve into the neurology of of some of this stuff is that a lot of people that are having these experiences actually do have differences in their brain hmm. that factors in there's people that have, have had sort of a mild uh, epileptic brain wave um that has has been with them all their life they don't know they've got it you know we wouldn't know they had it um who are experiencing more of this than the people who don't have it so even on a neurological level there's a, there's brain differences as well which is interesting yeah absolutely i mean even aspects yeah. as 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 incredible as being struck by lightning most people who get struck by lightning yeah. will die yeah some people get struck by lightning and it completely changes the way their brains work and they become extremely different people and definitely there are some people that have been struck numerous times and survived yeah Obviously there is the, i've forgotten the gentleman's name but there was a very famous i think he was a park ranger in the states who got struck seven times <laughs> you know i mean the chance of being struck more than once yeah. is incredible to even try and comprehend morgan and yet you have somebody like that and the majority of us haven't been struck by lightning and yet there are numerous examples of people who have been struck by lightning who have suddenly discovered that they're suddenly extremely artistic or they've be developed linguistic skills that they never even knew they could possibly comprehend so that alone on a on an understanding of how a brain works to trauma shows us that the expectation is you will die but it doesn't happen yeah. all the time and it has yeah. a very for some people very positive you know i'm not suggesting that we should all go out and get struck by lightning but <laughs> for some people it changes their life for the better yeah, yeah, it does. And, and there's been, you know, people not only in that, in that situation, but also people, for example, who have had, had, uh, organ transplants who have found the same thing, where all of a sudden, you know, it opens up a brand new ability. You know, they take mm -hmm. on an ability or characteristic of the person that they got the organ from. Again, another symptom of quantum entanglement, these, these cells getting shared back and forth that contain memory. And, uh, you know, they're, they're starting to understand now that it's like there's, there's so much more to the human experience than what we think. There was a, a great study by a fellow by the name of Dr. Morris Friedman in Ontario, uh, who's a, who's a neurologist as well. Um, and he ended up doing a, a really interesting study and it's, it's available online for anybody who wants to check it out, um, about brain damage and, uh, ESP and psychic ability. Mm. And what he was discovering, what he was looking at was people who had things like, you know, Alzheimer's or dementia, um, you know, some sort of brain injury, whatever. But what he realized was that sometimes these brain injuries would, it, what he felt was disrupting the filter that we have that kind of not necessarily blocks, but filters out that extrasensory phenomenon that's going on mm. like a, a camera that's blocking out uv rays right and it's like you damage that uv filter and all of a sudden the camera's picking up on all these uv rays too and he's he started to conclude that hey well wait a minute you know sometimes brain damage you know works to sort of destroy that filter and now all of a sudden you you know your brain's opened up to all of this like really cool stuff going on yeah absolutely i know i was i, I started reading a study that's that's been done at the moment in regards to parkinson's and looking at why people see ghosts and shadows that aren't there and what's happening in the brain that's causing that and once again clearly there is some neurological pathway that's being corrupted or diverted that is creating that that obviously is always there morgan but yeah. because of the degenerative nature of parkinson's it's it's rewiring the brain to remove that filter or is it creating something that isn't there anyway? Either way, that's an aspect that 30 years ago, nobody would even have the foggiest idea that was going on. Absolutely. And, and you know, these 
it, it's people like this that are, are moving the, you know, moving the platform forward. And, you know, I've, I've always been one to, I've, I've had lots of ghost hunter groups and stuff like that approach me over the years. And I've, I've always said to them, you know, no matter what you do, educate yourself, <laughs> turn television off, pick up some of these white papers, educate yourself as to what's going on, because it's not what you think it is. It's, it's not what you think. It's not what people are, are making it out to be. There is a plethora of in-depth, encouraging, informative studies and and information out there and we are so far ahead of where people think we are um or where the average joe thinks we are when it comes to this stuff and and to me you know the more we get into it the more we you know we discover this stuff the implications like what this means for medicine what this means for psychology what this means for the human experience i mean it's it's endless yeah absolutely i mean i am now i've been doing this two years morgan and i will confidently say the more i learn the less i know absolutely (laughs) absolutely (laughs) what i thought what i thought everything was five years ago i'm I'm, (laughs) I'm completely got in very different directions completely from what i believed and and i think when you stop taking on board information and learning and pushing yourself and having your preconceived ideas or your beliefs challenged you might as well give up because at that point you're not learning anymore you you've already decided and and as with any subject when we deal with the weird i think anybody that tells you that they've got the answers hasn't no absolutely Uh, and it's across the board you know when it comes to any anything like this you know everybody says it's it's almost like the arts like the way the way i always think about the paranormal is the arts because that's what, one of the reasons why I, I use fire in my in my lectures mm. um is because it it's really something you never master mm. you know you'll never master being a painter you will never master being you know an artist or a, like a musician there's always going to be next level next level next level and it's it's the same thing with this it's like you're never going to master yeah, parapsychology. It's it's an art form, and you know we're constantly it's expanding it. We're constantly moving in in new directions. New things are are being uncovered. And yeah, to turn around and say no, this is it. This is what this is. You know, you just you can't um, because probably you know five years from now we're going to be going. Oh my God, remember when we had that conversation? <laughs> <laughs> you know, something else is going to come out. There's going to be a new thing. So it's like you know all we can do is just you know report on what's going on now and just you know continuously have these conversations and and you know move them to move them to the next level every single time yeah well if nothing else it's been a very thought-provoking and challenging conversation morgan which is just what i expected <laughs> and I've, I've tried to hang <laughs> in there as best i can <laughs> so before i let you go obviously when you very kindly contributed to my 100th episode we touched on a subject which is always very popular and i've had a few people mention that if you're ever back that i had to touch on this and that was your surprising discovery in regards to a connection with a very famous wendigo story from canada yeah that, that story talk about paradigm shifting yes <laughs> talk about paradigm shifting because because that case um for me and and i mean i live very very close to uh to where this took place and within about a 20 minute drive you know it's it's funny because like i had if you had asked me you know six years ago you know do you put stock in you know something like this like do you think something like this could could exist and i would have said no and i learned a lesson with this where i i began to really realize the more i started to dig into it you know i started really realized that i'm like no no something's going on here like something is really going on here and there's aspects of this just like in every other aspect of the paranormal that is not explained yet there's something happening and so for me the wendigo was a massive eye opener and i look at lore and cases and and reports and things like that of similar things with a very very different eye now um and i've i've really taken the label of you know folklore or taken the label of a tale or whatever it is off of that and i've started to look at these in a way that's like no no you know this is this is phenomenon just in the same way any of this other stuff is we got to pay attention yeah i think the thing about the wendigo is it's one of those that if you just look at it through a modern eye i think you get a very different interpretation of what the vast majority of experiences are when it comes to this subject yeah i agree and i think as in how wendigos are often portrayed these days that is one of those situations where 
they're not described with antlers and looking like they do in off in many modern pictorial descriptions of them morgan they bear no yeah. resemblance to the to the first nations and native stories in regards to the wendigo and, and its effect and how it changes people and this the, there's a lot at play there you know not just folklore but a lot of social constrictions and and talking about things like cannibalism it seems to be a certain subject that is beyond the pale for many cultures around the world as well which kind of gives it a whole different dimension when you're dealing with these quite frightening situations because we're not talking about something that happened 100 years ago we're talking about situations that have occurred within the last century yeah and and some of it within the last you know 15 years mm-hmm. um you know and that i think that I think it throws people for a loop, and I think it's re- it's really easy to turn around again. You know, we've got a situation where people are like, "Oh, it's mental illness," or "Oh, it's a result of this," or "It's a result of that." But when you start to get into it, you start to realize that there is not really an explanation that fits. Um, the uh, one of the famous ethno historians that relates often to the Wendigo is uh, Nathan Carlson, and uh, he's actually from the University of Alberta here. And, uh, you know, when he he wrote an incredibly in-depth uh, paper uh, on the on the subject of, the, of Wendigo, what they call Wendigo psychosis, and, you know, bringing out all of this information, and, and there really isn't one solid piece of explanation um, to, to understand exactly what's going on. Um, you know, of course, uh, Chad Lewis, who's a good friend of mine, who I think he's brilliant. Mm-hmm. Um, he wrote a book recently on uh, Wendigo lore with uh, Kevin Lee Nelson. Yes. And, you know, they were uncovering cases where, you know, there's there's reports of, of these autopsies being done and these people being cut open. And the heart of the, the victim itself is encased in ice. Mm-hmm. Just exactly as the First Nations people talk about, mm-hmm. you know, and it's like, what is going on here? Mm-hmm. You know, there's there's something going on here, and and we don't have an explanation for it. I mean, First Nations people tell you straight out, like that's what this is. But I think we got to listen. We we really got to pay attention. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think it's one of those things often that when we deal with any kind of situation like that, often, especially after what's occurred over the last two hundred years, a lot of situations, and it's not just situations like the Wendigo, Morgan. Why is why is that? It's one of those things where. We have um, cave art where you will have lots of animals that we, you know, sheep and cows and bison and, <laughs> and all sorts. And then there'll be a big hairy man and people will go, well, that one's just a dream. Well, wh- wh- why, why are the others there then? Uh, yeah. Um, and I think that, it, as I say, there's, there's such a huge, uh, there, I think we dismiss First Nations people on such a basic level. Just in general, you know, we have been so dismissive of them as people, them as individuals them at, like it's on just such a broad level and we've dismissed their history and they have something to add to this <laughs> that we we can't we can't deny we've really we've really got to take a, a really deep look at some of the things that they're telling us because there's stuff in there that is is relevant it's absolutely relevant absolutely as always uh, appreciate investigate and research i think morgan yeah absolutely well, Morgan, thank you as always for your conversation. Where can everybody get hold of a, a copy of your wonderful book and keep up to date with your your marvelous video updates? Oh, they can find me at entityseeker.ca, and uh, every week on Facebook on the Facebook Entity Seeker page, you can find me under Morgan Knudsen, uh, and uh, we do spiritual health care every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Mountain Time, and I. Yeah, I highly encourage people that come in, we chat, we talk, we talk about tools, we talk about like all of this stuff, we go into great detail, it's so much, so much fun, and, um, but entityseeker.ca, of course, I'm on Twitter as well, under Morgan Knutson, um, Instagram, all of those places, you guys can find me, and tons and tons of classes and videos and stuff, uh, youtube.ca, or youtube.com slash entityseeker you guys can catch up on all of that as well so there's there's lots to talk about fabulous well listen thank you so much for coming back which is always a good thing as far as i'm concerned uh, it's been lovely to speak to you properly in depth uh, and have my my knowledge and my comprehension and my understanding of the paranormal pushed in every direction i didn't expect as usual um, so thank you as always morgan it's been an absolute pleasure thank you oh, thank you paul